Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Universities and Zoos Partnering for Biodiversity. This is one of SSU's Dig Into Nature Fall 2022 educational series for students and other members of the community. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm a program coordinator with the Center for Environmental Inquiry at SSU. I work at the Galbraith Preserve up in Mendocino County. So as your host, let me know if there's anything you need. If you can't hear me, if you're running into difficulties that you think we might be able to help with, let me know. Otherwise, um, you're, you're all muted and your videos are on, but you are uh, muted. You can take yourselves off mute when you need to ask questions So go on. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge, honor, and make visible that Sonoma State University and our preserves are on the ancestral lands of native peoples. And we encourage you to learn more about this at SSU at cei.sonoma.edu. Personally, I am coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Central Pomo in Southern Mendocino County. Can everyone please take a minute and type their names into the chat box? That is our sign in sheet. Thank you. Our presenters today are Adrienne Maisney and Mersney, I'm sorry. Okay. She is the conservation, I even practiced ahead of this. She's the conservation manager at the Oakland Zoo. And Jesse Bushnell, screwed that one up too, Bushnell, who is the director of conservation at the San Francisco Zoo. They will be joined today by SSU biology professor Nick Geist, who partnered right. with, the, with them on some of the projects they're gonna talk about. Before we begin, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the Center for Environmental Inquiry. We are here to empower students of all ages and all disciplines within the university to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay. Our motto as it were, which turn is to turn action from education to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor learning experiences on our three preserves, the Fairfield Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain and Ronert Park, the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County, where I am, and the Los Gilicos in Kenwood. We provide classes, workshops, and tours that focus on experiential learning and skill building. We also make the preserves open to anyone who has an interest in research, education, or creative inquiry. In addition to these projects, we invest in real world projects, working with faculty, community, and students across all disciplines to develop projects focused on finding solutions to North Bay environmental problems. And we create long-term multi-organizational partnerships that generate the resources and the funding needed to chip away at complex issues that surround things like fire, water, technology, and other topics. Today, we want you to leave with a better understanding of the connection with the environment, with our connection, with your connection with the environment, and with new or honed skills that our presenters will, will discuss with you that will help you contribute to sustainable solutions. After the presentations, Adrian will be the first and then Jesse will follow her and Nick will chime in as he feels so inclined to do. Uh, we will have our Q&A after that. But if you have questions as we go along, feel free to put them into the chat. And I will, eat, I will ask them during the Q&A period if that seems appropriate, otherwise hold them until after the presentations are done. Um, Jesse and Nick can stay on a little bit longer after the presentations, Adrian cannot. So if you have questions that we don't get to or wish to talk a little bit more, know that they will be here for a few minutes after the presentation. So we also, they will all put their email addresses into the chat and you can contact them with questions you have or you can contact me. Uh, I will put my email into the chat, but you have my email through all the, con the confirmation information that you've received. And with that, Adrian, Jesse and Nick, it, it's up to you, off you go. I'm going first, correct? Yes, you are going first. Okay. 
Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am gonna kind of do an introduction to kind of the broader aspects of how zoos can partner with universities. Jesse's gonna talk more about some really specific and really exciting programs that um, we've been able to partner on to help local wildlife. Uh, so as it was mentioned, frozen, I'm the conservation manager here at Oakland Zoo. Sorry, was there? No, Is anyone fine. else having trouble hearing her? Nope. Is anybody hearing me? Is that better? I can hear everybody. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I can hear everyone also. You're set it. Okay, Adrian. Okay, thanks. Um, so feel free to chime in if you have any specific questions. I'm happy to discuss as we move along. Um, so one of the ways our partnerships with uh, universities has worked out is uh, immediate responses to wildlife needs. So oftentimes things are happening and they need a live response to it. One of the things that has happened recently was with a hemorrhagic disease coming through the deltas and impacting the rabbits there. Um, so we were able to partner with universities like UC Davis and help work on a solution to this. So we worked with some of the graduate students there. We designed um, a capture vaccination and tagging program with them. And we're actually have moved to the phase now where they're not gonna have to do it as often because the rabbits that they're re-catching have already been vaccinated. So we can now start monitoring them and see how these rabbits are doing long-term if they need updates on the vaccine or anything like that. So it's been a really exciting program and a really unique opportunity to partner with universities that are right there on the Delta. Uh, if you wanna learn more, there's more information on our website. Um, other ways that we have been able to team up, which Jesse will go into more detail, is our Western Pond Turtle Program, where we were able to head start uh, turtles here at the zoo with Nick. Um, and we released to the wild and our mountain yellow legged frog program, which um, Jesse's going to go into more detail. Um, some of the specific programs that I've been uh, partnerships on and helping lead is camera trap studies. So we've been able to partner with some of our uh, conservation projects. For instance, the Jaguar, there's a conservation project called Caminando down in Panama. And I got that you're able to do. Sorry, is there a question? Um, and we were able to have students from Cal State East Bay help review some of these camera traps and help us identify some of the jaguars. So each of their rosettes or spots are unique to the individuals. And we're able to actually help Caminando track individuals as they're moving through Panama in different study areas. Um, we're also part of the UN program, which was started out in um, Chicago area, and that is monitoring urban wildlife. So we wanna know who's in the area. We have a transect of uh, almost 20 camera traps that move through the mountains up in Oakland, all the way down to the Bay. And we're just looking to see who's there. So students have been a huge help to help us review the thousands of photos that we get each month, because each little grass blade moves in front of a camera trap and you need to review what is actually moving there. Um, so that has been a huge help and a really unique partnership that we've been able to expand to different universities. Uh, we also have the opportunity to use the resources we have here to host graduate students who want to help us expand the knowledge we have of animal behavior and help use that to improve our husbandry techniques. Um, so unfortunately, we are still always battling the view that, you know, these animals are in these really sad cages, zoos are a sad place, but we have been doing a ton of work over the last couple of decades to really ensure that the psychological and physical welfare of animals is a top priority in all of our care. And a lot of that is science, being able to ask important questions and help apply them directly at zoos is how we can continue to improve the care that we're providing for these animals. Uh, we've actually gotten to work with Sonoma State students on two really exciting projects when I was a keeper. 
Um, the first was a um, enrichment study on the chimps who are just behind me over there. Um, and this was a project that she worked on for her master's program. So we were able to host her for multiple months. We were on the IACUC board to make sure that everything was up to standards and safety for the animals. So it was really a unique partnership and a really awesome opportunity for us to help each other in this way. We had the question, she was able to give us the answers to it. Uh, another really exciting program um, that I got to be a part of was a different master's student around the same time period. She, we had the question because we just had brand new baboons come to the zoo. And this was our first time any zoo had hosted the certain dynamic of Hamadryas baboons where we had multiple males that were teenagers and were gonna start forming their own harems in a group. We wanted to know what the group dynamics were because that would help us design how the animals were being housed, who could be with who, ways to reduce wounding. So this was really useful for us because some of them were aging out and they eventually passed away during the study. So being able to show how the groups interacted was vital to how we were able to provide successful care for these animals. And a graduate student at Sonoma State was able to help us with that question. And the data has actually been used by other zoos to help improve their husbandry techniques. Humans, we are also very interesting to study and graduate students and students have helped us with this also. So social science is a facet of the psychology field that is known as conservation psychology. So we want to know what motivates people, what drives them to do the right thing. Uh, all of us I'm sure have seen all the doom and gloom of the world is ending, climate change is gonna kill us all, but how do you actually talk to someone in a thoughtful way that can motivate them, inspire them and make them feel like they can have positive change on it. Conservation psychology helps us answer those questions. So I use it um, almost every day in my career here at the zoo. I'm in charge of a lot of the campaigns we do here. So if you ever come to Oakland Zoo and you see a sign that's talking about actions you can take, if you visit the legal wildlife exhibit, if you visit the habitarium, if you take any of our pledges, that was things that I did and I helped build. Um, and that was using conservation psychology. How can we motivate people and help them be inspired by this? It's a really fascinating field. Um, and we've been able to partner with a lot of colleges and grad students on this. So we currently have an in-house, oh, sorry about that format got weird. Um, we currently have an in-house student that is with us as a fellowship grant for the next year. And he is just doing surveys um, because really we wanna know what's the takeaway a lot of our visitors are having. I make a lot of these programs, but I'm not sure what the follow through is on it. I'm not sure if people are taking that next step, if they're sharing it with other people. So being able to have a student here at the zoo to help us ask these questions and help us evaluate is a huge help to make sure that we're improving and we're evolving and growing this program. Um, so having grad students and really any level students, undergrads too, data is data and we always can use help. So those are some of the ways that university and zoos can work together. Ultimately, it's a team up. Both of us are helping each other out. As I said, we have questions and the students are helping us answer a lot of those questions. They're getting experience from it and we're able to help them successfully get their degrees that they're working towards while we're benefiting by helping animals both here and if they're able to publish in most other universities. And that is all I have. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I hand it over to Jesse? I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Here's where I might chime in. Yeah. That is that little story, that little anecdote I told about one of our students working on our Western Pond Turtle project with the both zoos. And she was a very good student, four year, four year uh, biology major, graduated. And I remember her saying to me, 
you know, I, I spent four years here getting my biology degree and I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. She worked one summer with us, with our collaboration, working side by side with folks from the zoos. She said, now I know what I want to do. This was her senior year. This was her summer after her senior year. She ended up getting an internship with you guys at Oakland and I believe became a keeper. And it's, she found her passion just through sort of incidentally through this collaboration. So it was a really kind of heartwarming story, you know, for me as a professor to see somebody find themselves that way was just wonderful. That was wonderful to hear. Okay. Okay. Jesse, you're on. All right. Sounds good. Um, hello, everyone. I am Jesse Bouchel. I'm with the San Francisco Zoo and Gardens. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, programs that um, Adrian referred to. And let's see if I can get this to not moving forward. Let's see. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, so we at San Francisco Zoo, um, these are some of the animals that we work with with our conservation program. So currently we're head starting four species of amphibian, one of reptile and one insect. Um, and so we tended to um, lean heavily towards smaller animals that we can um, make a larger impact with our small facilities that we have here. But we also wanted to make sure that we were working with animals that um, we could make a difference. So we really focus, as you can see, on threatened and endangered species. Today, we'll refer, um, talk mostly about just Western pond turtles and mountain yellow legged frogs, because these are the two species that historically San Francisco and Oakland have in the past or currently are collaborating with. And they all, we have so many stories that we could talk for an hour. So I'm going to try really hard to keep it as short as I can um, and make sure that I don't use up all of our time. Um, just a quick overview the Western pond turtle is the only native freshwater aquatic turtle that we have on the western coast except for the painted turtle that's found way up at the very top um, and shares some habitat with the western pond turtle. Um, they are two species that have been lumped together and separated and lumped together and separated but currently are referred to as Actinemys marmorata and Actinemys pallida so the southern western and the northern western pond turtles and they range all the way from Washington state down through Baja California and across into um, Nevada. And they are protected across their range in all the states, at least some protections. There are so many threats facing this turtle, it's just difficult to really pinpoint even this list. But um, the, you know, historically here in California, especially drought is a really big one that is never ending and predation of by bullfrogs and other invasives. And then obviously introduced invasive species like the non-native turtles pushing out our, are taking over some of the ponds and the food and the breeding habitat are another big ones. But there's so many factors and there's, there's so much work that needs to be done for this turtle in specifically, but it is up for federal listing. So there, there may be some, some relief in sight for um, long-term preservation and conservation of this species or these two species. Um, I'm just going to really quickly go through this project that Nick Geist and the two zoos worked with over the past, I don't know, I guess it was about almost 10 years that we worked together. And I, I always like to start off talking about this project by letting you know how it started, because it is not your typical like, hey, we have this animal that we really all want to work with, let's figure out how to make it work. Instead, it was literally Nick calling the zoo and be like, who can I talk to? I have this idea for a project and I, I need to talk to whoever can help me make this project work. And the idea was, you know, he had this vision of wanting to learn more about this turtle and its reproductive work, its sex, de sex determination, um, uh, the, sorry, the temperature dependent sex determination was something that he was really interested in because he's a dinosaur guy and dinosaurs have that. And so he knew turtles had this and he wanted to learn more about it, but he didn't want it to be a terminal experiment. He wanted it to be um, something where he could also give back to the environment and make sure these baby turtles could survive and become part of the, you know, the environment in the wild. And um, so he contacted us and he contacted Oakland. And in his own words, I think he didn't really expect anybody to return his call. And both of us jumped on it like, hey, those are, we love those say. turtles. <laughs> we love baby turtles. We love Western pond turtles. I was hoping um, one of you <laughs> would just say, maybe one of them will say. So here's a little bit of backstory and then I'm not gonna take too much time. 
But I had, you know, I wanted to use Western pond turtles as a model organism. And here at Sonoma State, I knew I could get the eggs from the wild. I could incubate them. But then I had this side effect, which was going to be baby turtles. And it's like, well, I can do all the other stuff, but I don't know what to do with baby turtles. That's where the other part of this project came in. That's when I called you guys. It's like, you're perfect for that. I said, please, I'm hoping one of them. And they just went, yes. And it was like that. And we took off from there. So sorry to interrupt, Jess. Oh, no, you're fine. So that was in 2008. Um, and we had some very specific goals when we started off. We wanted to learn more about how we could create an infrastructure to rear these baby turtles because neither of us had really done baby turtles before. We had adult turtles, but we needed to learn more. And then Nick was mostly interested in learning about these poorly understood um, aspects of the biology of this species. And it was a great partnership. As Nick said, like we as the zoos, we had the animal rearing experience, we had the staff, we had the veterinarians, um, and we had the space. So we definitely could hold these animals. He had the undergraduates and the graduate students that wanted to do these projects. They had the enthusiasm, the energy, the time, because being in the field, like you takes days and days of sitting in the field. And Nick had the experience and the enthusiasm to work in the field. So it was a good partnership because we both could play to our strengths. And essentially he was mostly interested in um, speaking for you, Nick here, but um, looking at reproductive biology and the temperature dependent sex determination, which basically if you don't know, turtles and alligators or crocodilians, they are not depend, their sex isn't predetermined when fertilization happens and as they develop. Instead, their sex is determined by the temperature that the eggs are incubated in the ground. So temperature affects whether you have males or females. And you can manipulate that, or each year can be slightly different depending on the weather and where the female turtle lays her eggs. And so that's what Nick was interested in. Like, what is that pivotal temperature that makes a male or a female? And then through these years of working with them, we also had all these other projects that came out looking at incubation temperature, whether hatchling success was dependent upon the female or where she laid her eggs and what the behavior was, all these projects that came out of this one pivotal question. And so in order to do this, to answer these questions, um, Nick <laughs> developed this tree blind so that the people could sit way up in the top of these trees, watch the females who are very skittish come out of this pond lay their eggs, and then the undergraduates and graduate students would run over and mark the spot, dig up the eggs, or put, put predator exclusion devices on the nest to keep the predators out, depending on what project we were doing. Because um, the major problem at this site in Lake County that we were working at was egg predation. In fact, we have a video that somebody got of a fox, I think it was, coming up, smelling a turtle laying her eggs, leaving, and then coming back later that night and digging up the nest. So they smell the urine that the female turtle leaves when she, when she digs her nest that she uses to soften the soil, and then they hone in on that and come back. So the egg predation is a big issue. So we had to keep the predators out or take the eggs with us. Um, and so there's a lot of work that happened in the field. In fact, it was weeks and weeks of work that these guys spent in the field. And then they brought the eggs off into Sonoma State. Um, a much earlier picture of Nick. Um, after incubation, where they incubated at different temperatures to determine what that pivotal temperature was, they brought the animals to the zoos and we reared them for one year. And down the bottom here, you can see how quickly these baby turtles grow. They, they're amazingly fast growers when they have enough food in the space. Um, and then here, one of the major parts of our story to help Nick was that we had to determine what sex they were. Because turtles, you can't, they don't have external genitalia. You can't tell if they're boys or girls. You have to wait till they're adults, and that's usually 10 years or older, to really know if they're male or female based on morphological looks that they have. So instead, our veterinarians at the two zoos developed a procedure to use an endoscope, a tiny little camera, and look inside to see if it's male or female. And in case you ever wanted to see what the gonads of a turtle look like, <laughs> at the top here we have the ovaries and on the bottom we have the testes. And this is what we were looking for. Oh, Jesse, I didn't know this was going to be x-rated. <laughs> <laughs> so the coolest thing about this to me was if you look at this graph, the top, it goes males, 26 degrees on the, the temperatures on the bottom, percent males on the side. And this was one of Nick's students' work. You can see across the top, there's male, 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 male. And then 
a massive drop down to 0% male. That's where the females are. So the incubation temperature for male is big. It's like 26 to 29.4. 29.4 to just over 30 are females. So there's a huge difference in the temperature range for determining male or determining female. And it was pretty cool. This was like, you know, totally interesting information that nobody else had really looked at for this species before. Yeah, I'll say that when I started the project, it was one of those things where I went, oh, somebody has to have done this, right? It's like, this is such an obvious question. I said, well, I'm going to do a literature search. And I went, oh, <laughs> nobody had. And it was yeah. like, wow, okay, so wide open subject for us. I will point out one other thing is the last two or three years we were up there, we were in a drought and the temperatures were high. We were incubating the eggs naturally in the nests and we got close to 95% females, which is not a great thing. And that's a temperature change role that emerged from this. As you pointed out, one study just leads to two others and two more, et cetera. And that's kind of the beauty of science, but anyway. Thank it's true. It's true. And that's what happened between 2008 and 2017. I could remember seven graduate students. There might have been more, but there were also undergraduate students that had side projects and things like that. And so there was a whole wealth of information that came out of this, this field project. And we also had a lot of fun. So this is all of us in the field taking the going out and doing the collections of the eggs watching the females come out to nest and also doing the releases. And it was a spectrum of people that helped all ages from, you know, eight-year-olds to adults to me and Nick, the older, the older people in the party. Um, our best times are probably the releases. There was nothing like watching these turtles swim away. And we actually had to go into the pond and, and as you can see, get very wet. It was, it was a lot of fun. And we had some great years and some great summers. And there were a lot of successes. Um, I mean, we had we had a number of students that were trained to do field biology. We had dedicated facilities. We had this methodology that our vets developed that we've used for other species. It's been really amazing and helpful for them. We answered all these different questions and we released, I think, I don't know the exact number. I think it's right around 350 turtles between the two zoos, which basically probably doubled the population at this site in Lake County. But there were also challenges. There are also problems. Um, this picture is one year we went to do the release and there was no, literally no water, like none. The drought, it was a drought year and there was no water, no place to release the turtles. I was going to look up there this year, Jesse, and it's even worse. Uh, I can imagine. We're in a thousand year drought. So this is, you know, there's yeah. no inlets or outlets for this, uh, for the, it's a vernal pool and it's bad, which is kind of sad, but hopefully the turtles hang on. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, there's also a money issue. I mean, it's not cheap to do this. It's not super expensive for turtles, but you do need to have some funds and that's always challenging. And then we also had released enough turtles at this site. We doubled the population and this project kind of had a natural end, a successful end, but a natural end. But there were other projects that came out of this collaboration. We had students from Fresno State, from Stanford, from Sonoma, from San Jose State, from Dominican College, all these people started working and there's probably lots that I missed just because we had this ability to help these students and give them a shot at give them data or have them work with us. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that came out of this collaboration that led to more collaborations. And so having all this information, we decided we needed to start looking for new projects to compare our data with or to use our experiences with. And a great opportunity arose in Mountain Lake in San Francisco's Presidio. Um, and this is it down in the very right or right hand corner here, you can see the lake. And it was a great opportunity to kind of be part of an experiment in ecological restoration, as well as ask the same questions we had asked in Lake County, but kind of at a bigger level with more space and more different partners. Um, it was, there are a lot of animals that were being introduced to this restored area. All these different species are native and were being put into a lake that had previously basically been dead. I mean, it was just overrun by, sturgeon. This is a six foot sturgeon that we pulled out of the lake. Um, there are about 60, more than 60 non-native turtles. There were crayfish. There was just so thousands and thousands of non-native fish to the point where we had to actually rotten on the lake in order to get rid of all the non-native species. But it was just really a mess. It runoff from the um, freeway had made it a toxic swamp. And so it really took um, it took a village to remove all this stuff and make a healthy lake system. 
Um, and you can see from these pictures kind of the before is on the right and then the after is on the left and then uh, just a historical picture that gives you an idea of the when the mountain lake was first developed um, in that area before the I think that's before the golf course came in that's in the Presidio. And again, we partnered with Sonoma State and had this graduate student who was looking at all kinds of different attributes of the turtle and how we could make a better turtle release, how we could monitor them in a better and more informed way, including using telemetry. We ended up using acoustic telemetry and seeing how they're moving under the water. And it really, again, it took our, our research to another level and allowed us to really learn a lot more about this species of, of our native turtle. And then we took all that information and added another project. We're working in the Marin Headlands, the North Bay project here for you guys, um, partnering with the National Park Service where we're working to restore Western Pontrils to the Marin Headlands where they have been um, not detected in over 20 years. And so for, between 2017 and 2021, we released 89 turtles that we reared. These are animals that were from Point Reyes National Seashore, which was the largest um, breeding population in close proximity to the Marin Headlands, same genetics, the closest big population that we could take animals from um, without impacting the population there. And so we worked again with Sonoma State's graduate students on finding the eggs and bringing them to the zoos and incubating them here and then doing a whole release and asking sort of similar questions with a different spin. Um, we definitely had a male bias population here because it's cold there and <laughs> everything was like much chillier than in Lake County. And so that was a big problem. Like we don't wanna release all males. So then we had to do more incubating and using that pivotal sex determination um, information that we got from years and years ago to help us know how to incubate the turtle eggs successfully. And then we have other projects working with the turtles. Um, we're doing these Bay Area wide disease surveys for shell disease, which is an emerging pathogen that's impacting turtles. We've been working with a couple of our partners to do some salvage of drought stricken lakes and streams and ponds and rearing those animals to return them back to those ponds when they get restored. Um, and so that one call from Nick in 2007, I have to say it changed my life and it changed the trajectory of this institution and how we think about conservation and really helped to lead us to this ongoing and emerging um, local conservation push that we've that we and Oakland Zoo, both of us have really been um, moving forward rapidly and finding that there's a niche for this and there's a need, a huge need for zoos like us to work locally in our backyards. It's great for us to talk about how much work we need to do in Africa or in Asia or in South America, but we have a lot of problems in our own backyard. And it's great that we can step in and work with our partners, our, the parks, the cities, and the researchers, the universities to answer these questions. And a natural move from turtles was to go to frogs. And the Mount Yellow Lake of Frogs is another project that both Oakland Zoo and San Francisco are collaborating on with several, several partners. And I'm gonna make this short because I know I'm running a little low on time, but um, basically, if you don't know, frogs are in trouble. There's a huge decline in amphibian populations across the globe. And here in California, we're not exempt. There's been major losses just here in these pristine habitats like in the Sierra Nevada. So Rana Sierra, it's a Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, had a, almost a 93% decline over about 10 to 15 years. And the Southern Mountain yellow-legged frog had a 96% decline over the same period of time. And the main reasons for those we think are introduced fish, combined with disease, but there's lots of problems and lots of ideas on what could be causing these um, massive declines in these pristine habitats. We know that disease is a big issue for this particular species. Um, in 2007 and eight, the Sierra Nevada started losing these frogs and it was featured in a National Geographic uh, magazine as well because it was such a major decline from tens of thousands of these frogs in lakes to basically tens of thousands of carcasses at these lakes. But chytrid fungus, which is this pathogen that impacts these frogs all over the world, it's a global phenomenon that we're still trying to learn more about and figure out what's going on, but it's driven the extinction of over 200 species. And I wanna thank um, Rochelle Stiles, who's my coworker who developed a lot of these frog photos and frog um, 
slides for me. She's really good at this kind of stuff. So she, about 90% of the yellow-legged frogs have disappeared from the Sierra Nevada mountains, as we saw before. But there were some really innovative researchers at University of California, Santa Barbara, who created and were researching the idea of trying to immunize these frogs and trying to save them by basically vaccinating them. If you think about fungus and bacteria and viruses, we can make it so that we as humans can be protected against them. Why can't we do that for frogs? We do that for other animals. We do that for our dogs and our cats. And so it was a really like innovative idea, like let's figure out how to protect them. And essentially you infect the frogs, just like a vaccination, then you treat them so that they're not sick. And then you can test to see if you reinfect them, do they get sick again? And that's basically what they were doing in Santa Barbara. And that led us to this partnership that we, decided to create this conservation program for mountain yellow-legged frogs where we would either salvage populations before they go extinct, captively rear them to reintroduce them to populations where they have, used to be and no longer exist, and then we do this immunization slash vaccination project. Um, we here at San Francisco are, have worked in four main locations, um, Lake Tahoe, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, Yosemite National Park, and Plumas National Forest are the main places that we have worked with this species. And we collaborate with UC Santa Barbara and the Sierra Nevada um, Aquatic Research Lab, which is part of UC Santa Barbara. And of course, Oakland is also collaborating with these same people. We're kind of all combined together into one project. Essentially what we do is we rear frogs from the tadpole phase at the top to the sub-adult or adult phase on the bottom before we release them and immunize them. And this is one of our setups where we have tadpoles. And essentially what, what cultured fungus does is it attacks the skin and it, it makes the skin so they're shedding, the frogs are shedding constantly and it thickens the skin and it makes it hard for them to um, basically do their natural biology, biological functions, which is to let the water go across the skin membrane for them to breathe and kind of just have this porous skin allow it. And the kitchen fungus kind of makes it so that doesn't work correctly, essentially. And so we can take swabs of the skin and measure the amount of fungus in the skin. And so when we're treating them or vaccinating them, we basically infect them with this fungus and then we test them to see how sick they get to make sure they don't get too sick. And right before that point, we treat them with an antifungal so that they're healthy again. And then we let them get big and strong and then we release them back to the wild. And the idea is that when they encounter that fungus again, they'll have a natural antibody response. Their body will be able to fight it off. And so this is kind of an example of how it works. Essentially, we have a control group and an exposed group. And we did this with some naive frogs and we did this with some exposed frogs where we would expose them to chytrid fungus and treat them and then test and release them. And then they're being recaptured in the wild to see whether or not they're surviving. So it's a mark recapture program in the wild, in the field. And one of the cool things, this is just some one of the many different projects that are being worked on. It's hard to see, but basically the top bar is um, animals that or naive on the left. Those are animals that had never been exposed to chytrid before. They got exposed and they got really sick. So as, the, as you get higher up on that um, graph, you get sicker. And the ones that had been previously exposed, you can see they didn't get quite as sick. So they're below that red line. And that red line is basically a level where we expect them to die. And so it's very similar in the zoos, the ones that we infect kind of have this natural response and don't get as sick, just like on the left-hand graph, that's an, those are from the wild. Those are from animals that are persisting in the field and are, are showing that they can fight off the infection. That's the lower bar on the, on the right-hand side. So what we're seeing in the zoos, this experimental group, is very similar to what we're seeing in the wild for animals that have made it through this chytrid wave and are persisting. Those are the ones that are like the ones that we're exposing. So we think it's working. We think that we're actually getting a similar response in, the, in our zoos when before we release them to what animals that are surviving are experiencing. Um, and just to give you an idea, since um, 2014, San Francisco zoos released 
2,700 animals back to frogs, mountain yellow give frogs back to 14 sites in the Sierra Nevada. And I know I just got some numbers from Oakland. I think Oakland's released about 560 over that same period of time. So together, our two zoos have released over 3,200 frogs back to the wild and they're breeding, they're surviving. We have um, at least a 20 to 25% recapture rate at most of the sites where we're releasing. And you gotta imagine these are high alpine lakes that are really deep and the frogs are really hard to catch. So a, even a 25% recapture rate is really phenomenal because these guys can jump pretty far and they can escape really easily. So again, working with our partners in the field at UC Santa Barbara, we also collaborate with a variety of other universities. And this is a group effort with so many different collaborators. It's pretty amazing. In fact, Here's a list of all of our collaborators for our frog and turtle programs um, over the years. It's it's a never ending collaboration that we have between the two institutions. And we like to we want to make sure that people know we're doing this. We like to talk about and educate our our visitors and our friends about it because we are trying to save our local species. We are trying to make a difference and we are trying to make sure that um, these animals stick around. So that's what we're doing to help these guys. And I know that a lot of people ask what we can do to help. Um, so we like to kind of give a few ideas of ways, and you guys probably know these, but you know, getting involved with local habitat restoration, joining some citizen science research programs, volunteering, um, supporting local conservation. Voting is one I forgot to put on here, and this is the year of the election. Elections are coming up. Your vote makes a big difference and really can, um, can show your commitment to conservation to biodiversity and to you know local species backyard species um, and then i always like to talk about turtles because this is also a big issue um, i run the stud book for the captive population of western pond turtles and i would say every year we get a half a dozen animals that people find crossing the road they think oh i'm just going to pick up this turtle and take it home it must be lost or it must be sick Oftentimes those turtles are just looking for a place to nest. Um, so we try to encourage there's a kind of a separate list for how you can help a turtle that I put up here. Um, everything from, you know, helping it cross the road, but don't take it home to making sure that, you know, you think about your water, you create maybe pick up some litter when you go out for a hike, don't release native pets. Um, you're welcome to read this and, and uh, pass it on if you'd like. And then, oops. We're happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Or Nick, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I was just going to say that last point is I get, because I'm the pond turtle guy in Sonoma County, depending on the season, yeah, I get contact from people. We found this turtle in the road. If it's certain time, like in spring, it's usually a male looking for a pond, looking for girls, female pond turtles. And like you said, if it's in the month of July or June, mostly, it's probably a, a gravid female looking for a nest. Right, but that's again, people they're, they're trying to do good, but they they don't know. There's and maybe that's a big part of this too, Jess, is educating the public, right? Is getting the word out, getting signage up at the spots, uh, letting people know about their native wildlife. And you guys have done a great job, and we try and do the same thing here. So really nice. Thank you. There were a couple of questions in, in the uh, chat that um, I'm not sure which one of you would is best positioned to answer them, but one of the questions was, what are some of the non-native turtles and uh, what do they look like? How do they differ from our native turtles? Well, we got, and that's, there are more in, in urban areas, there are more non-native turtles than there are Western pond turtles. Um, I don't know. I'm old enough to remember when, when I was a kid, you could go to Woolworths and you'd get a little turtle and they'd often paint their shells, their carapace, and you'd take them home. And it's great. What the parents, when they got their turtle for their kids, they didn't realize the turtle was going to outlive their kids. And it was going to go from, turn from this cute thing into this rather large, nasty beast. And those are red-eared sliders and yellow-bellied sliders, which are native to the American Southeast and the Mississippi River drainage. Mm -hmm. They're large, they're aggressive, they outcompete our really mellow Western pond turtles. And people, like I said, don't realize, oh, that's gonna live 80, 90, 100 years, right? So um, those are the red-eared sliders and yellow-bellied sliders are the main uh, non-native turtles. And they, they compete with our, they outcompete Western pond turtles. 
you yeah. know. Yeah. Unfortunately, like for us going to Golden Gate Park, you will not see a Western Pond Trail in Golden nope. Gate Park. All you see are non-natives and they're mud turtles, red-eared sliders, painted turtles, um, red belly turtles, yellow belly turtles. I mean, it's it's amazing. The 60 something turtles we pulled out of Mountain Lake when we did that that program, I mean, it was there were probably 10 different species. And yep. sadly, it's, you know, people think they're doing the right thing. They're putting them in the in a proper place and they're trying to do their best, but they don't realize that they're adding these turtles into a habitat that they're not designed for it. Maybe the water's not warm enough or there's predators there or the food source isn't there. They also risk disease. They can be bringing inadvertently, you know, bringing a disease to the native turtles that live there. Um, and you know a lot of those animals don't survive so it's better to go to a rescue center or a rehab center and try to surrender your animal and let them find an appropriate home for them it's it's a lot better and that's for not just turtles it's for any species um, yeah. You know. Every, yeah you're right everybody thinks they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart and they really are but and the, the question here is i see turtles yeah and the, our ponds at ssu i have trapped turtles there for many years and they're about 10 to one non-natives, mostly red-eared sliders. Mm -hmm. There were some Western pond turtles there. Uh, we get those occasionally, um, but I think the numbers are dwindling mostly because right now uh, their entrance there is we have Copeland Creek runs right along the campus. And when the drought, it's completely dry. That used to be an avenue for turtles, otters, a lot of wildlife, aquatic wildlife to go move up and down, including fish. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, but people, they released their turtles into the ponds there. And we've had, we even had a big uh, snapping turtle. Somebody oh caught. <laughs> oh my gosh. Big scary monster. <laughs> yeah. Well, at Mountain Lake, one of the things that they want to do is really prevent um, people introducing non natives back into this lake that they had spent millions of dollars to restore. And so a really innovative thing that I, I think is under, utilized is the idea of an amnesty box. So yeah. they built an amnesty box, which is a, it was a large structure with water in it and people could surrender their pets there. So they have signs all over like, put your turtle in here, put your frog in here, your goldfish in here. Like goldfish do not do well. They, they become giant carp, but they also destroy the habitat if they serve. Yeah. So we've gotten dozens of turtles that people have put in the amnesty box. We've gotten all kinds of fish. Um, so it's really worked, but it, it takes a lot of effort to let people know it's there. But I think it's something that could be useful other places too. And, and yeah. it also takes it. a lot of work from you guys at the zoos. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to be able to take and care for those animals, right? To make this a, a mm -hmm. program that people are going to buy into. Right. And it has to be checked every day. So <laughs> Yeah, that was about to say, how often do you have to monitor yeah. that? That's so cool. Yeah. And you wow. also, somebody asked, why isn't SSU on the frog collaborators? Well, how about that? I that sounds like you know. I was just thinking that during the talk as well. I am a herpetologist, so uh, <laughs> maybe we should start looking at. Well, one thing I talked Box. with you about, Jesse, is that my research now. I've got an army of undergraduates and a grad student working on the creek here, the local creeks, on ecological restoration, trying to increase biodiversity, restore natural stream flows, and part of that is one of the things is I got into it because people said we're saying. Well, years ago, we used to see, and I used to see Western pond turtles in the local creeks, but nobody's seen them for years. And part mm -hmm. of it is the environmental degradation, the, 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 the environment is in bad shape. And there are simple things, relatively simple things that I think we can do. And this would be a place where I was just thinking about this with the native amphibians, the native reptiles, the frogs and others, that it might be a natural partnership for us with the zoos to first of all, get the environment, get the creeks back. And freshwater habitats are very vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, but get those back into better shape. We're working on water quality right now and, and, and some other aspects. But then in the long term, the real thing we got to think about is reintroducing the, the, the vertebrates as well. So that's something we should definitely be talking about. That'd be a really exciting program moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's get, it, it'll get it's already getting a lot of support and enthusiasm from the, the local community and the university. It's one of those things where it's just like nobody loses, right? Mm -hmm. Including the wildlife and especially the wildlife. Yeah. yeah. Are there people monitoring the, the freshwater creeks? I mean, like the Navarro watershed, which is where where we are on the Galbraith. 
Is anybody kind of paying attention to and reporting if we see? I don't know. I've talked to a number of people in Marin County, particularly because they have, you know, um, and certainly on GGNRA, the folks at the Golden Gate National Recreational Area, because they're looking, they have uh, Salmonid runs and they've been doing it, but it's kind of a piecemeal effort, you know? And so what I'm, I'm kind of looking into now is reaching out to folks around the North Bay and the Bay Area who are working and seeing maybe we can collab again. Collaborations can be very powerful things. So what helps us salmon is also helps the turtles. Oh yeah. It, it's one of the things that I, I use the turtles and I realize this is when you talk about sort of keystone species, or in this case, not a keystone, but a sentinel species. In our freshwater yeah. environments on, along the West Coast, Western pond turtles are an apex predator. And if you go to an ecosystem, you go to a pond or a creek or a stream, and you see a healthy population of Western pond turtles, that's a pretty good indication that the all the trophic levels, that entire food web, is going to be in pretty good shape. You know, you don't have to look at everything. You look at those top predators, like sharks in marine ecosystems, right? So what I've been thinking about with the creeks here, we get those in shape. The turtles will come back, but only if the environment is, is favorable. I think one of the issues that I've seen with salmon um, restoration projects is that it makes the, the creeks really nice and it does help with that. But for turtles and other species, they need the upland habitat. Yep. So a lot of times that's not included in those development plans for creek restoration because they're really focused on one species or the aquatic side. Yeah. And for turtles, you need to have upland, you need to have nesting habitat. You need some place where they can go away and, and get away from the water if there's drought or problems with the water. And the same for many amphibian species. So any type of restoration isn't just the creek, it's the creek and half a mile around it right so yeah. that takes a lot that's a lot more work and I, I think that's where you need to have multiple agencies and multiple collaborators um because otherwise you get too focused on just that one one species and one aspect so i think that there's a lot of potential for that because there's a lot of work right now going into restoring creeks for salmon and for other fish species that utilize those waterways and are you know we're losing them so they want to preserve them now we just have to jump on those those projects and think about all the other species that that need the help too. Well, you brought up Mountain Lake and you might remember one of the very first things I did when I went down there is I started walking around the outside the lake and looking to see if there was appropriate nesting. And apparently we've had nest, nesting turtles there, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I spotted an area that looked just right on the kind of Northeast side. I said, well, okay, because you yeah, exactly, you've got to think about more than just the aquatic habitat. Absolutely. Luckily, California's 3530 plan is actually addressing a lot of the freshwater systems that are often forgotten in this. Like everybody's so focused on protecting just land or just ocean, they forget there's marshes, all kinds of different bodies of water that are in between that need addressing. Yeah, which are centers for biodiversity, freshwater ecosystems. Yeah. And they're getting lost at a ridiculous rate globally. How serious is the bullfrog invasion? It's a problem. They, uh, they're they one of the main predators on baby Western pond turtles, mm -hmm. uh, but they also prey, yeah. The problem with bullfrogs is once they get in, it's really problematic to get rid of them. So that's part of our, our idea with the Western pond turtles is by bolstering the populations. You know, if, if the populations drop below a certain level, then a species like Western pond turtles become very vulnerable to local extirpation. If you have enough of them, they are probably going to be resilient enough to deal with that. Because, and that's one of the reasons Mountain, uh, not, well, we got rid of the bullfrogs in Mountain Lake, but Boggs Lake in Lake County had no bullfrogs, mm. which made it a really prime location where most other more urbanized uh, waterways are loaded with them. How do you get rid of them? Uh, you drain the pond and kill them all. Which or if, is, you, if you can't do that, then <laughs> you spend a lot of years trying to get them or removing the eggs and the tadpoles. That's what they've been doing in Yosemite for um, and other areas for these restoration projects for the frogs is um, and also for the turtles, too, is you got to spend decades sometimes. Yeah, it's slow yeah. and it's mm -hmm. excruciatingly hard. Uh, like I said, if it's a small pond, if you could drain it, you can just that'll they need to have their water for reproduction.
but I, it's kind of a losing battle in a lot of cases, right, Jesse? I mean, it's hard. Yeah, it's tough. They're, they're pretty invasive, for sure. I any... admire them. They're a very efficient predator. Yeah. Are there any other questions out there? Our audience is notably quiet. <laughs> no? Yeah, chime in. Well, then I guess it's, it's time for us to wrap up. But I want to thank you all so much for this, you know, behind the scenes look at what the relationships can be, how the synergy works between the two types of institutions, and specifically what are some of the issues with the frogs and the, and the native turtles. Um, we did record today's session, and it will be posted on our website. I will let you all know by email when it has been posted. Feel free to go visit yourself and to refer anyone that you know to, to the website to look at the recording. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, this is one of the several events that are offered for free by the center. And you can find the full listing at cei.sonoma.edu forward slash calendar. I'll put that into the chat. Um, and we also, we offer natural history hikes every Saturday on the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain. You can sign up for those on the website, and, or you actually don't even need to sign up. You can just kind of appear. There'll be a map that you can find on our website. Uh, and our next virtual event is going to be on November 29th. It's a ways off at 12 o'clock, where uh, Kevin Monroe, who's done many of our programs, before he will be talking, he's a nature conservancy expert, will be talking about insects after dark. And he is an entomologist, not to be um, well, to be reckoned with, I guess. He really knows his, his insects and a wonderful presenter. So that's that's it for our program today. Thank you all so very much for your excellent presentations. It was most interesting. And for those of you who attended, thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure to see you all and hope to see you again very soon.